Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to this uh, Dialogue of Leaders, where our main topic of this afternoon, orchestrating international cooperation in a multipolar world. Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this uh, last session of the Anti-Crisis Conference that was held over the last two days. It seems to me that over the last two days, one of the main topics that was put on the agenda has received a strong consensus. We started our conversation yesterday about the concern that advanced countries might be going towards secular stagnations, meaning low growth, low inflation for the next decade. We we're trying also to figure out if there was a way to revive growth in the world economy through the support of emerging markets. Also, we felt that there is clearly a need to finance infrastructure and to try to provide long-term finance. There was a strong discussion this morning about the trend towards financial globalizations as we are seeing more and more fragmentations in the Eurozone and other countries. And we want real financial globalization to finance the real economy. What I would like to do this afternoon is really to try to lay out some diagnostic and some characteristic about some long-term trend in the global economy in order to kick off some questions and answers and debate among our leaders. One, China. We learned that China is about to overtake the United States as the world's largest economy. Since the later, it's believed to be the world's largest economy since the 80s, 70s, I think this is a major moment. So, China's rising power and influence must be recognized and accommodated in global affairs. We know that transition in power are very difficult. As former China Premier Deng Xiaoping said, hide your brightness, cherish obscurity. So, can and should China match economic might with a willingness to take responsibility in world affairs and become our stakeholders? Two, Europe. The current generation of European leaders, all the Eurozone together, through a mix of political experimentations and commitment toward the Eurozone. Do we think that the next group of leaders in Europe can cope with economic stagnations and political uncertainty? The Eurozone crisis has created a new European architecture, new fight fighting mechanism, a banking unions, and new rules to deal with fiscal discipline. So, on the eve of the European Parliament elections, and for our members of our panel today, is the monetary union is now political sustainable? Is the solution is more Europe? At the time that anti-EU sentiment is ringing very high in most of the Eurozone countries. On globalizations, Globalizations have nurtured a loss of control, a sense that more and more decisions that affect citizens' daily lives are taken far away and without regard for their interests. So, is globalization sustainable in the long run? On inequality, recently a book, Capital in the 21st Century, by my co-citizen, in fact, Professor Thomas Piketty, has sparked a major debate about inequality around the world. Professor Piketty argued that inequality has grown in the United States and Europe over the past decade because a small elite has captured more wage income and returns on accumulated wealth have outstripped economic growth. Is that trend is sustainable? On global governance, is a transition to a new order is likely to see more rivalry and competition than cooperation. In fact, in a multipolar world, do we need to have greater international cooperation? So this is more or less a couple of questions that I would like to lay out to our leaders this afternoon. And maybe uh, I'm quite privileged to ask uh, Karim Masimov, Prime Minister of Kazakhstan, I'd like to thank you for accepting our invitation to be with us this afternoon, maybe to kick off the conversation and maybe to concentrate in a multipolar world, do we need to have greater international cooperation? Prime Minister, please. First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to see all of you here today. And uh, this kind of forum is the uh, fifth time in Astana. And I would like to thank all of the panel panelists over here and all of the guests for the opportunity to discuss uh, such an important issue. Uh, we are living in a, uh, quite an interesting time in the development of the world. and. Um, I already discussed it with some of the colleagues yesterday that uh, there are two different uh, visions how the world uh, should be developed. 
one is the Western point of view, that the whole life is a progress in the future, and the other one is more Oriental point of view, when, when the world is developing by cycles. And if we will take into consideration the cycle in development, and particularly if you look on the Chinese point of view, uh, that this year in 2014 we are living on a different cycle, uh, the ne next 30 year cycle, which is completely different what we have seen 30 years before. And whether we like it or not, we are living in a different world right now. And some of the rules which were uh, widely accepted in the global world in 2013 doesn't work in 2014. And if we go into some practical realities, we see that um, uh, in the world, the globalization doesn't work anymore under the previous games. And we see in 2014 that the rules of the games have been changed. And right now, some of the governments are telling their companies and corporations where they can work and where they, where they cannot work, which means that the geopolitics sometimes becoming more important than uh, the glo global economy. And in a country like Kazakhstan, we have to take into consideration that the rule of the games have been changed. And when we are making some uh, practical decision, we should be very careful in our approach. Uh, particularly speaking about us, you know that in one week from today, uh, the Eurasian Economic Union will be signed over here in Astana, and Kazakhstan will be part of this organization. Uh, but at the same time, Kazakhstan uh, will be politically independent, and we want to join WTO within this year. We want to sign an enhanced cooperation agreement with the European Union. We want to develop our relationship with China, and we want to be a part of the Eurasian Economic Union at the same time. This is number one issue. Number two issue, we will see uh, from my point of view in next decade that uh, our strategic partner Russia will pay more attention for the cooperation with the East rather than with the West. And Kazakhstan geopolitically is located uh, between Russia and China and we will see that a lot of transportation flows, capital flows, uh, and etc. will be going from Russia to China and from China to Russia and we should benefit our positioning. We should capitalize our geopolitical position over here and try to attract the investment from all over the world to Kazakhstan in order to, uh, to be more stable. And I think uh, that uh, right now everybody should think very carefully what is the new rules of the game. Thank you very much for the opportunity to start up this discussion. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Why don't we kick off on what you just said? You know, what are the new rules of the game in uh, the international financial architecture? If maybe uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair might want to, to comment on that. Um, thank you, and thank you uh, once again for, for having me to the Astana Economic Forum that I'm delighted to see uh, continues to grow in importance every year. Um, I think that there are two things that definitely will, will not change and are, are forces that are creating an, a, an enormous amount of, of um, displacement in the normal international architecture. The first is that the, the developing world will continue to grow in importance and is already accounting for roughly half of output, half of investment. Um, the rise of China will continue to be um, manifest. So the, the way the world looks economically is going to change dramatically. And the second force that won't change is that globalization is gonna carry on making the world more interdependent. So if you take those things together, a world in which the geopolitics is changing, as, as Kareem has just said, and um, a world where globalization is going to make us more interdependent than ever before, that obviously has consequences for the way that we, we handle the, the international institutions. And I think those consequences are really twofold. The first is the actual institutions of global governance 
themselves will have to change. So the composition and method of operation of the major international financial institutions, uh, and even including the UN Security Council in time, has got to change in order to reflect that, that reality, which is why, by the way, the G20 has superseded in, in, in impact, really, the G8. And secondly, we're going to have to look at how we make those institutions of global governance more effective. And this, I think, is a, a real challenge because the truth is we need those global institutions to be effective more than ever before. And yet, I would say there are major challenges in most of them as to how effective they really are. Now, I think the new leadership in the World Bank is looking at, at how they play a different role in the world today. But if you take the range, for example, of UN institutions around the world, I would say there's, there's big challenges of efficacy, quite apart from challenges of, of, of governance. So my view is, yes, uh, we are in, a, in an entirely new world. Um, but so far, the institutions of global governance haven't caught up with that reality, either in the way they're composed or in the effectiveness they have in meeting the challenges that we face in common. Thank you. Thank you. Just to follow up on that, and maybe I can ask uh, our Chinese friends here, Mr. Zhang, um, in a sense that uh, China's role in the global economy is becoming more and more influential. Uh, over the last two days, there were some discussions that China was very keen to establish a set of new institutions, a, pro a proposal to establish an Asian infrastructure bank, the fact that China wants to internationalize the renminbi, there was also the potential of creating a BRIC development bank, and it's also under the Shanghai Cooperation umbrella to create also here a new institutions. So what is the role of China as a global economy, and are we seeing a new type of global governance emerging? Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, can I speak Chinese? Of course. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, you raised a very interesting question. 呃，我们大家一直一直在讨论一个问题，就是全球的 a n t c r a z y 那么这个问题呢，呃，看起来是。I thank uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the possibility to speak. Uh, in the past two days, we have heard many interesting discussions. regarding finance, but first of all, what I want to say is including the theme of uh, speeches by Mr. Blair and uh, uh, gentlemen leading the Kazakh delegation, I believe what we're discussing here is not even more economic, but more of a philosophical problem, we have to think about the future of global development. Where would the soul come from? So we have to look generally at the global development to find the driver, to find the vector of development. We should all think that irrespective of what we develop, it may be completely different dimensions, completely different products. That's all irrelevant. But there is a goal to make man live better. And we have discussed that for development, that for making money, doing everything for money, but money is not everything. Henceforth, China in the 
past years, if we're speaking of China, that China will supersede America in its economic development. Why did they decide even to mention this? After the reforms of Mr. Deng Xiaoping, uh, from the reforms of openness, uh, over 30 years have passed. But we're now continuing to develop, and what Mr. Hu Jintao said, had, has been saying in the past five years. Since he had become, since he came to office, uh, since he has become chairman of the country, he's using absolutely all possible efforts so that the people would live better irrespective of what will be the actual GDP. And there we have a direct correlation with politics. And what we are saying, in essence, is a real growth of the methods and uh, ways of achieving the goals. I myself am a media person. I come from press. And we must ensure healthy development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vuk Jeremic, um, Prime Minister Tony Blair mentioned you know, global governance and the need for reforming the current international financial architecture to make the IMF, the World Bank, and the other international financial institutions more effective. You are the president of the General Assembly. What is your take on that? Well, uh, I agree. Well, thank you very much, and thank you very much for uh, the organizers. This is now my first time in Astana. It's, it's a great privilege uh, to be here. The World uh, Crisis Conference was actually uh, started as a result of a General Assembly resolution uh, that was adopted during my presidency, and I'm very happy to see that this is now going on and that there is going to be a continued discussion uh, on this issue. Uh, I couldn't agree more with Prime Minister Blair that uh, there is a flux in international relations and there is a, there is a very vibrant development and that the global institutions haven't really caught up uh, in terms of their, uh, in terms of their changing, their, their adapting to the new reality. And uh, I think that uh, the challenges that we're now facing, the Prime Minister also mentioned the, uh, the geopolitics versus the geoeconomics and whether uh, they're the two sides of the same coin or they're starting to get into conflict as a result of the, uh, of the developing uh, forces. Uh, I'd like to to draw your attention to the fact that uh, this year we are marking the, uh, the centenary of, uh, of a great global conflict of the First World War. And uh, it started in, uh, in a world in which uh, globalization was the key word and the, the growing uh, interdependency of economic interest around the world. And, and very few people believe that under such circumstances uh, a conflict can uh, break up, especially one of, uh, of a global nature. So I think it's, uh, it's worth, uh, you know, trying to learn the lessons of the past because we live in a very uh, uh, combustible world. And the place where we're all convening right now at equal footing is the United Nations, is the General Assembly. It has in front of it an enormous task, a task to come up with uh, uh, a new set of development goals that are going to be pertinent and relevant for the coming 15 years. The Millennium Development Goals are expiring, and uh, it is the task of the General Assembly to, to come up with a new set of global goals. But they need to be sustainable, they need to be multidimensional, they need to involve the, uh, the social aspect just as they need to involve the environmental aspect and, uh, and the economic one as well. And uh, I think that we are uh, unfortunately uh, 
perhaps um, uh, not standing up to the challenge right now, because I'm following what is going on in the multilateral discussions and debate in the General Assembly. We're not getting there. At this pace, we're not going to get there in time. In 2015, there is also an enormously important conference coming up in Paris, COP21, on climate change. Uh, this is a reality. Uh, it's perhaps not a reality for everybody, but I come from a country uh, that uh, in the last week had suffered its biggest devastation in history. And we've gone through a fair share of wars and conflicts, but the torrential rains that we had in Serbia in the last five days have brought about the biggest natural disaster and the biggest humanitarian disaster in our recorded history. So the climate change is very much real and it's very much there. It's part of the global development, uh, sustainable development discussion, and it is taking place in the General Assembly. If that's not uh, taken very, very seriously, uh, I'm afraid that we're gonna continue sliding and sliding very quickly, precipitating as a matter of fact, into a very, very shaky, unruly world in which a thing like something that took place 100 years ago might uh, very well happen again. Thank you. Maybe, Mr. Acharya, do you share that pessimism? Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I would like to thank you, but I, I, I slightly have a different idea on that. Uh, of course, uh, globalization and integration is very, very uh, factor, very much fact of life, and that is true with us. But what we should be also looking at, if you're really looking at the peaceful and the equitable global order, we should be also looking at the deprivation and the level of poverty that is around the world. I think if we don't deal with that in the long run, I think uh, not in the long run, I should say, it is already affecting many countries when you have a deprivation, when you have a high level of poverty, the conflict is around, and that will affect everyone. I think this is, this is the reality of the world in which we live. Uh, we cannot just say that you know, conflict is somewhere else and we are living in some other parts of the world. Uh, therefore, I think what I would say is that what post-2015 development agenda and the United Nations is trying to do is to really, really try to make sure that the eradication of poverty remains on the central agenda of the global development efforts. And we also try to bring in, as the, uh, as the former president of General Assembly said, the climate change, the environmental sustainability, protection of the natural capital, but also economic growth, infrastructure, and the, uh, you know, the, the development of, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, economic potentials and productivity in the central stage of development agenda. What we did try in the past was that the MDG was right in the sense that it was focused on human and social development, but it is not enough. Uh, looking at the uh, challenges that many countries, especially when you look at the uh, least developed countries, small islands, and the con countries in conflict, if you do not really look at the productivity side, look, do not look at the economic growth side, together with the human and social development, you cannot have a sustainable world. That's why I think the discussions that are going on in New York and elsewhere, we had had an extensive national consultation on post-2015 development agenda, and what we are really trying to bring together, of course, the process is very lengthy. It has to go through the uh, many rounds of negotiation through the member states. But we are confident that by 2015, we'll have the uh, post-2015 development agenda in which we're not only looking at the poverty eradication. That will be some, you know, uh, number one agenda. But we'll be also looking at the economic growth infrastructure, sustainable economic growth, as well as the environmental sustainability and the protection of the natural capital. I think taken these three together in a more integrated manner would be the, uh, the way the future should be looking at. And then again, I think what we are also trying to look at is that uh, no one is leaving behind, left behind in this process, but also that we have to make the institution fit for purpose. And that is the challenge that we face, that uh, the interdependence is now growing, but the institutions have not been reformed to the extent that they can be really taking uh, a really multilateralistic but also really setting the rules and regulations for the new world. I think this is the challenge that we continuously face, but we are trying to do our best, and the United Nations will also, uh, also be reformed in the way that it will be looking at the issues, the way that it will be helping the countries, the way that it will be setting the norms for the global uh, development prospects in the future. Thank you. Mr. Kitui. Thank you very much. Um, 
One of the main challenges that should inform dialogue about multilateralism is a more comprehensive understanding of what globalization really has as its essence. One, last year, 80% of all international trade was trade in intermediate goods and services. What it means really is that the revolution in trade has replaced goods with tasks, nations trade tasks. Globalized production requires a global regime of governance. Even just the notion of how do you fairly allocate value between owners of intellectual property and effective producers of products is a discourse that is too much dominated by transnational corporations today. Two, the revolution of human communication has domesticated to all of us collective plight. Whether it's a crisis of finance, the crisis of uh, climate, communicable disease, we now live in a very connected world where a regime of disciplining management of crisis requires collective action. Number three, in terms of rulemaking, multilateralism, the gains that we celebrate in international trade today are a product of collective action about restraining the excesses of the powerful. Today, multilateralism is under threat by selective engagement of the powerful in regional trade negotiations. The transatlantic partnership, the transpacific partnership are selective in what are priority concerns, mostly driven by intellectual property right interests but part of the agenda of development or inclusive, not leaving anybody behind, should be emphasizing that questions of protection for collective good have always been questions that cannot be negotiated by regional players alone. Questions of the, dull, uh, the, the, the painful experience, which the world is not up to adequately addressing today, the overexploitation of the commons the consequences of the subsidy on certain fisheries, the impact of fuel subsidies on certain fishing excessive behavior in some regions of the world. These are not issues going to be solved by dialogue between the powerful and the powerful. They are issues which are going to be part of the multilateral agenda that we must all apply ourselves to. Thank you. Thank you. So, David Stark, are we moving away toward multilateralism? Are we seeing more regional agreement, bilateral agreement, free trade agreement. What's the role of WTO in that context? So you hear a lot of people sort of wringing their hands. Sorry. You hear a lot of people sort of wringing their hands. They see these very large regional agreements and they say, does this mean that people have given up on multilateralism? I think what's missed uh, when you hear this is that this is not as new as people might, uh, might think of it. There are now approaching 400 uh, regional bilateral preferential arrangements. Now you might say, we've got some particularly large ones occurring, uh, but this isn't so, so new either. We had the NAFTA, which, which uh, brought together three very large economies. We had the EU, an enormous project uh, involving over 400 million people. Uh, did these lead to people drawing away from multilateralism? I would say no. Uh, when you look at, at Europe, when you look at the, the NAFTA parties, what you see are a number of countries that are members of large integration organizations that are still among the strongest of supporters of the multilateral trading system. Uh, now, do we need to put a little more energy into the multilateral trading system? Sure. Uh, we had uh, a very important success recently, uh, this past December, in Bali, Indonesia where we reached agreements for the first time uh, really in, in the short lifetime of, of the WTO on, on some vital issues like trade facilitation, agriculture, and, and development. Uh, and we think that that's given us some momentum, which we're trying to work with other members to build upon to deliver more in terms of the rules of the multilateral system. So you know, we think that, that uh, bilateralism, regionalism has, has lived for a long time uh, in a symbiotic relationship with multilateralism, and we think that that can continue. Uh, members, just members of the World Trade Organization, of the international community, just need to continue 
uh, as they work on these other projects to continue to put the same kind of energy that's needed into multilateral rules. Thank you. Uh, before we kick off to the second part of our conversation about Europe, is there anyone who wants to comment on global governance, sort of erosion of multilateralism? I want to remember your, uh, the audience that uh, uh, the US and the US Congress was not able to fulfill its commitment toward the change of governance structure at the IMF. So that's created a threat and a vacuum within the institution. So if there are anyone who wants to pursue the discussion on global governance, globalization, new rule of the game of global finance before we kick off to the Eurozone issues. Yes, please. Um, Thank you. I would like uh, to go back to the beginning of uh, our meeting and re once again uh, remind what Mr. Karimov spoke about, about the cycles of China development. The first one started in the 80s uh, when after the finish of post-war restoration and the 70s crisis, there they started to stimulate private consumption. Two years ago, uh, we discussed uh, this uh, private sector demand, and uh, we realized that currently in EU, in the United States, uh, households uh, spend 20% more than they actually earn. How we can solve this issue once uh, the dollar stimulation consumption rate mechanism will stop working, what will happen then with these economies? And I am quite pessimistic regarding this uh, very narrow look at economic development and whether IMF and other financial institutions uh, could uh, stimulate the uh, financial world because the stimulation so far was focusing on quantitative easing, on uh, decreasing uh, the Federal Reserve System rate. There's no way to decrease this uh, rate further down. That is why we are facing the situation where either we will face very significant decrease uh, of uh, living standards of population, even further down the 30s, of the past century, or we'll try to find alternative way to boost demand, to boost consumption. And uh, this alternative source is here in uh, the different regions, because we see that the absolutely objective economic processes lead us to understand that, that mechanisms of globalization, which are rest uh, on uh, equal system of stimulating consumption based on US dollar, they are no longer effective and the mechanism of regionalizations uh, became more and more evident. That is why when we talk about the role of different uh, regions, we have to understand that this uh, interrelations uh, should be on different principles. Because on one hand, uh, when we see uh, the cooperation between the regions in the framework of one single dollar system, and it is absolutely different paradigm when the two regions have different currency systems. And I believe in this uh, transformation, transformation from the relationship in the framework of single currency system to the multi-currency system, there will be a next uh, transformation in uh, the 30, next uh, 30 years in the framework again of these Chinese cycles. And again, I would like uh, to say while starting for more than 15 years of those processes which are currently in financial system, uh, I uh, do not see uh, either alternative, uh, other alternative opportunities how we can boost the consumption rate in order to keep uh, the private consumption rate as it is now. And uh, under these circumstances, I'm rather pessimistic regarding the future in terms of keeping the current model active. Thank you. Uh, just one short observation only. Uh, starting from Tony Blair, you, everybody has correctly pointed the necessity or reform or the working of the international financial and monetary system. 
I do agree, but uh, I think that uh, in this moment this is concretely impossible, you know, because, uh, and also the passage that uh, you mentioned, Tony, of from G8 to G20 has not given substantial results. It was necessary, but the results are not here. Why? Simply because in this moment, the United States has no interest to reform all the monetary system. China has no interest because they will do much better in five years or seven years' time. So we are in a typical moment in which we can only do minor changes, but you know the effort to do the great reform that he, here everybody thinks is indispensable is not, in my opinion, is not realistic. You know, we have to think how. Can we create a common interest to do that in the future? In this moment, I think that uh, is not possible. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Yep. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. Um, just to say three uh, little things about international governance. First, obviously, the system of the United Nations is the, is the hair of the Second World War. It is impossible to say that represents the world as it, as it is today. So reform is inevitable. It will be very difficult, but to reform the system of the United Nations is apparently inevitable. The second, uh, I would call the attention that NATO survived to the fall of the Berlin Wall. And NATO is probably the link, the most relevant link between Americans and Europeans. Other relations between Americans and Europeans have already lived better days. Uh, third, Professor Prodi is probably right. He doesn't see common interest, but there is a huge democratic problem if we don't regulate international financial markets. Um, financial, uh, uh, globalization don't need, don't need rules, but don't need bureaucracy. There is a difference between the two things. Uh, but the, the, the reason why we need regulation on uh, globalization and mainly on financial markets is not jeopardizing legitimacy on political power. If we don't do it, we'll create a global distrust in political institutions. Thank you. Dear colleagues, I would like to offer uh, another outlook. I think that uh, the fundamental challenge revealed by the global economic crisis is that existing institutions are not capable to catch up with societal change and transformation. In this respect, our goal is to understand the essence of these changes. The old paradigm of economic development is no longer capable to explain and forecast directions and paces of economic development. A new paradigm of economic development is hence needed based on a new consensus. I think that in the modern and fast changing world, the development world is not longer characterized by the amount of industrial output, but instead by the amount of knowledge output. This means that human and societal development moves towards post-industrial society, that is the basis, process, and system conditions of the human society are changing, that will consequently shape societal institutions. More specifically, if industrial output is the basis process of an industrial society, and the institutions shall ensure favorable conditions for the factors of production, 
the thinking process of the basis process and knowledge output characterize the post-industrial society. These are fundamentally two different paradigms of development. They require different sets of criteria and performance indicators. Human, business and social group, motivation and dynamics are also distinct in these paradigms. Hence, there is no one-size-fits-all solution for the development agenda of low-income countries, developing, count developing and developed countries. Depending on the level of development, the motivation and the needs of people, businesses and institutions change. This, however, does not mean that there can't be a global and common agenda. This instead means that diagnosis and recommendations for stimulation of economic development are different. Processes of industrial societies prevail in low-income countries. These countries can be united by a uniform technological platform of economic exchange characterized by the depth of processing and production of goods and services. I believe that in globalized world, this unity can create significant and material economic value and potential for economic development and growth. The idea of Eurasian economic space proposed by the President Nazarbayev that is being successfully implemented now is a vivid example of this. Hence, my thesis is globalization through globalization. Globalization through globalization. This means global regional unions operating on a unified technological platform. Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we go to our second item for our discussion today, which is Europe. Uh, as I said before in my introductory remark, we are going to have European parliamentary elections over the weekend. So is the solution is more Europe at a time of anti-EU sentiment? Why don't I ask uh, Alfred Gusenbauer to kick off the conversation on Europe? Well, there are different expectations concerning the upcoming elections on, uh, on Sunday that today already started in the United Kingdom uh, and in the Netherlands. Uh, there is a certain skepticism in uh, many of the member countries about the uh, problem-solving uh, capacity uh, of the European Union. Uh, nevertheless, I think that the pro-European parties uh, will uh, remain to be the strongest in the European Parliament. And uh, even if uh, governments could be put under pressure from uh, parliamentarians, I think that uh, governments uh, of the member countries are, are sticking to a pro-European orientation. So at the end of the day, we will have a pro-European council, a pro-European commission, and a pro-European uh, majority in the European Parliament, which should offer uh, a basis for the future challenges. But I think uh, there is an increasing consensus that uh, a certain refocusing of the European Union uh, is necessary, uh, which means that the uh, European Union should not interfere in too many small things and, uh, um, and be stronger and, and bolder uh, in the big issues for, for our continent. And I think uh, this uh, became especially clear uh, in the last weeks uh, in the face of the Ukrainian crisis. It showed to the Europeans how important it would be to have, uh, for instance, a common foreign and security policy. And this is uh, much more important than uh, some details of uh, 
sophisticated, fine-tuned uh, regulations on uh, uh, several products uh, that are uh, that are traded uh, within Europe. So uh, there is, uh, I think, uh, a certain tendency uh, to go back to the real priorities of the of the European project. Of course, uh, in the context of our debate today and yesterday, there was a lot of talk about uh, the Eurozone and uh, have we fixed the crisis or not. Uh, well, I think that uh, the talk about uh, uh, the crisis of the euro is mostly finished because the euro is a quite strong currency, again, uh, appreciated very much against the US dollar. Some think in Europe that uh, the euro is already too strong again. Uh, there are, of course, some underlying economic issues uh, that still have to be addressed. I mean, the consolidation of the banking sector is uh, far from being completed. Uh, the banking union is an additional instrument uh, to strengthen uh, surveillance uh, instruments uh, within Europe. That is, of course, not replacing uh, economic policies done by, uh, by the member countries, but again, it's, uh, it's a further step. But nevertheless, uh, there are deficits in the architecture uh, of the Eurozone uh, that uh, became obvious uh, throughout the crisis. I mean, the architecture of the Eurozone was, uh, uh, was designed under the um, illusion that we are going into a crisis-free future, and uh, 2008, uh, 2009, uh, very brutally showed us that uh, this is not going to happen. And uh, in a very creative uh, um, manner, uh, leaders of the European Union then uh, tried to invent new institutions uh, aside the treaties uh, or uh, neighboring the treaties or whatsoever uh, in order to address the challenges that were uh, put ahead of us. But uh, let's face it, uh, the Eurozone is uh, coming back to growth. Uh, if uh, the situation in the east of us is not deteriorating, which means that the tensions between uh, Europe uh, and, uh, and Russia uh, that are visible as a result of the Ukrainian crisis, that these tensions are not getting stronger. So if this is not uh, the fact, and if no other external shocks are arising, I think gradually we are coming uh, back to growth. But uh, still the unsolved issue in many of the member countries uh, are the robustly high numbers uh, of unemployment, and especially of youth unemployment. And this uh, is not only a human and social catastrophe, uh, but it's also an expression of the um, unused enormous potential of talent uh, that is there uh, in Europe and is not, uh, and is not properly uh, used uh, in the economic process. And therefore, uh, my guess would be that uh, if we are able to sort out some of the uh, basic uh, macroeconomic problems in Europe, and I think we are close to that, uh, that the main priority for the years to come uh, will be to combat uh, unemployment and youth unemployment because this structurally uh, for the further destiny of the European economy will be the most decisive thing. Thank you. Christopher Pizarides, is the Eurozone crisis is over? Well, it's nice to hear that that it's over. It, it's not quite over because I see the eurozone as being flat. I mean, you're saying that it's uh, recovering is recovering by point something less than one percent, and given the folds that we've seen over the last few years, that's hardly recovery. It's better than going deeper down. But but when all these uh, European um, institutions and, uh, and new structures were set up. That's not what we were looking forward to. I think the problem with Europe is that we rushed into um, 
creating various things like the single currency and and um, giving centralized institutions powers over monetary and fiscal policy without developing them sufficiently well. And when the crisis came, they, they were not powerful enough to make decisions, so we fell back to relying on national leaders to make the decisions. But then national leaders uh, are um, elected in their own countries. They care much more about their own countries than Europe. I mean, they, I'm not saying they don't care about Europe, but obviously they care where, where their voters are. And as a result, those who are more powerful within, you know, those who provide the funding that is need, needed for that, have a much stronger hand than what you would hope for in a complete European Union. And that's the outcome we're seeing, the unemployment, the migration out of the um, uh, poor countries, the growing gap between the rich and the poor. You know, if you look at income uh, movements, uh, national income movements per head since um, 2008, the gap between uh, uh, Germany and the countries of the South, for example, has grown, whereas before it was uh, shrinking. Uh, the unemployment gap obviously has grown. You know, Germany has 5% unemployment. The average of all the uh, peripheral countries is about 20%. They have deflation, and yet the European Central Bank is not inflating. Even if we look at average inflation rates in Europe, it's 0.7%. The European Central Bank said many times that its target is just below 2%. I read that as being 1.8, 1.9. It's more than one whole percentage point from 0.7. It's not doing anything about it. And when you read the Financial Times or The Economist, why then what they're looking for is what the, the German representative, the Bundesbank representative is saying at council meetings and is telling them rather than any joint decision from the European institutions. So, I echo uh, what was said before by Prime Ministers Blair and, and Prodi that, that we do need a new institutional structure. We don't so much need to reform the structure as we need to develop it to be able to make decisions that are good for, for Europe as a whole. And experience has shown in the past that we get our new institutions when there is a big crisis, like a major war. Hopefully this Eurozone crisis and the unemployment crisis, especially in the peripheral countries, will awaken European leaders to move a little bit faster to creating the new institutions that will take care of the whole of the Eurozone and not isolated pockets here and there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Paolo Porters. Um, ah, yes, please. President Mejic, please. The idea of the European Union is one of The importance here is we have to remember that United Europe excludes war as a political means. Why? For we opened our borders, so there would be no motivation for war. But Europe now is being criticized quite strongly. It's enough to see how many people, how many people come to European elections. If people don't feel that they participate, that they have a say, they won't come to election. In other words, for Europe today, the United Europe as a European community, for it to be the most elite economic and political club, Europe has to solve some of its institutional problems. Naturally, Europe, and it's true for the whole world, Europe must better regulate financial area so things don't happen of the likes of events of 2008. When I speak of the world of finance, I speak of regulatory bodies. And it, that's both true for monetary and fiscal policies. If Europe can handle this problem and can do so well, then uh, South East of Europe will come in into Europe better. For without it, Europe is not really united. It can be really united with its. Uh, only then can Europe be a big player among other big players. Thank you. Should the ECB pursue quantitative easing? 
Well, I, I would start. I would like to start by commenting on the euro or the uh, role of the euro. I actually think the euro is a red herring. Um, if you look at across the countries that are members of the eurozone, what has happened in the past uh, 20 or 25 years, it's very different. Um, in uh, Ireland, for example, I suppose we uh, think about the countries that were uh, uh, mentioned as potential problem countries after Greece, uh, the Greece problems. Ireland, Spain, Italy, and Portugal. Um, Ireland, um, through its uh, taxation policy, uh, making uh, future taxes virtually certain, uh, experienced a tremendous growth in the 90s. Um, we know that uh, the story didn't end so well, uh, probably because of uh, insufficient banking regulation. So that was a problem of Ireland, um, specifically to Ireland, and uh, I would say independent of uh, Euro or not. S um, let's take Spain, Italy, and, and, and Portugal. Um, in those countries, if you look at uh, the best measures we have of a uh, nation's uh, technology level, uh, what we call total factor productivity. Um, in all three of those nations, it, it, grow, it grew at acceptable rates from 1960 to 1990. After 1990, flat for over 20 years. That's absolutely shocking. And of course, the related variable, uh, aggregate variable uh, labor productivity, same, uh, uh, same flatness. Uh, and this seems to have been a structural problem that started well before either of these countries mem uh, joined the Eurozone. Um, now, uh, one, one might say that the financial crisis made it clear that uh, there were problems in those countries. Um, I would say the problem had uh, little to do with the, the euro, maybe the euro contributed to, uh, to our discovering those problems. But at the same time, uh, the problems were uh, attributed to the euro, which I think is very misplaced. They, they were structural problems that dated back well before the euro and, uh, and, and probably had little to do with uh, being a member of the euro. Now, the sad thing is that nothing as a consequence of uh, blaming it on the euro, nothing seems to be done uh, to, uh, to uh, solve these problems. Uh, there, are, there are obvious things one could think about, but the last thing you want to do is uh, do something to the banking system so that, um, so that it will be difficult to obtain, for entrepreneurs to obtain financing for their, uh, or credit for their projects. Uh, sometimes it's tempting to, to scale back on uh, funding for scientific uh, uh, progress. Though, uh, that, would, uh, that would be a very misplaced uh, measure. Uh, so, uh, so I, would, I would conclude by saying that the fact that Things are so different across different countries in the Eurozone. That's almost, uh, it, it's very convincing, convincing evidence that it wasn't really the Euro. It, they were problems associated with each of the nations. And of course, uh, in some sense, uh, fiscal policy is, is always more important than uh, monetary policy. And uh, I suppose it would be tempting to uh, to, uh, to uh, guess that the lack of uh, a fiscal structure associated with the Eurozone could have been a factor, but, but again, these are, these are likely to be uh, problems associated with, the, with each individual country. Thank you. Paulo Portas, please. Um, <clears throat> I, would, uh, I would disagree 
diplomatically of, with some wording from prof the professor, there were some problems with the euro because medium, little and grand countries were used to the bad habit of not respecting the rules of euro year after year. And that was not a problem of Portugal, Spain and Italy. That was also the problem of France and Germany during years, in the first years of Euro. So just, uh, I don't, um, I would, the, the, the worst for the European project is cultural prejudice. The North with virtues, the South with problems. There's no two equal human beings and there's no two equal countries as the professor recognized. And the contribution from the South and the center and um, uh, for uh, the history of Europe is very competitive. So uh, I, I, would, I would disadvise in a mandatory way any kind of uh, uh, demagogic discussion on the North and the South. Or you have one Europe with the current members of EU or you have a split. And if you have a split, you fail. Take care with cultural prejudice. It's worse and more difficult than financial crisis. And you pay the price after. The second question I would say is, if you pay attention, Europe is better than it was one year ago. Um, you have two countries who have, I, I personally think that Europe uh, has a, um, there was a moment, I would call it the draggy moment, where the correct words were said, we'll do whatever it needs to save the euro. That commitment showed political will. And that was the turning moment. You have two countries, Ireland and Portugal, with clean exit of the programs with Troika, directly to markets, without precautionary programs. So you can't say that there are not improvements. There are. Two of the countries who had a program with Troika fulfilled the goals. In my country, we reduced the deficit in three years from 10% to 4%. And real economy with structural reforms reached a huge transformation from 28% of exports on GDP to 41%. Enterprises are more agile than governments. And the third thing I want to say, not to, that, that there is what can we do to increase economic growth in Europe? Probably a lot of people uh, paid attention to the list of the 10 largest world companies that came out some days ago. The three first are Chinese. In the, 10, the top 10, you have Chinese companies, American companies. Where is the first European? 11th. Europe is a disputed continent to live. It's the major economic bloc but we have a real competitiveness problem. And the own way to keep competitiveness is reform, reform. Flexibilize, flexibilize. What can we do better? To be very simple, two things, very simple and provocative. First, to reach a free trade agreement with the United States. That will improve growth, in the American economy and growth in the European economy, if there is good face at the negotiation table. Second, we need a stable agreement with Russia. We don't choose neighbors, we choose friends or allies. It's not, it's, it's an error to have a confrontational relation with Russia as if Russia was Soviet Union or the era of the Cold War. Russia, it's our neighbor. We have some common interests, we have differences in other aspects, but we need a stable relation with uh, Russia and we need stability in Euro-Asia.
Thank you. Prime Minister Tony Blair, you are not a member of the Eurozone, your country, but what can be done to revive growth in Europe? The thing about Europe is, Europe is a, Europe is a perfect idea, but um, imperfectly implemented. Okay, so the rationale for Europe today has, in my view, never been stronger. When you have the rise of, of China and India and large population countries where GDP and population will be more closely aligned, the idea of countries in Europe coming together and doing together what they're unable to do on their own, that rationale has never been stronger. But Europe right now, in my view, has, has three essential challenges, which can be overcome, but you, we have to recognize that they are challenges. The first is in respect of the Eurozone, where, where I agree as a result of the ECB action, the liquidity issue, as it were, is resolved. But we still have major structural reforms and competitive, re, competitiveness reforms that we have to do in Europe in order to make us fit and capable in, in the modern world. And those structural reforms are an absolutely indispensable part of making the single currency work in the future. The second um, challenge is in relation to the political institutions of Europe because though I agree you may well end up in a situation where the European Parliament has a majority of pro-European parties, nonetheless you are going to have a curious feature of this European Parliament if the polls are anything like right, which is you're going to have a very large block of anti-European people sitting in the European Parliament. Now, I think we haven't we're going to have to think through the implications of that and what that means for the sense that people have often of alienation from those European institutions, necessary though they are for European integration. And I think that will pose us some significant political challenges. Indeed, I think the biggest risks actually are, the, are going to be as much political as they will be economic over this coming period. And the third thing is that if we want to ignite a sense of support and, and, and passion for the European idea, we have to go back to what it's all about, which is precisely that Europe, by combining together medium-sized and small countries in the 21st century, can make the collective weight of the European Union work to the advantage of the individual member states and of the world as a whole. And that means focusing on the, on the big issues that Europe has got to, to face up to. Now, competitiveness is one, but you can think of a common energy policy, a common defense policy, how you deal with the problems of illegal migration across, across the world. There are, in other words, there are a whole set of things that Europe could do and do better that would find an immediate support and echo in the, in the views of the European public. Now, are we going to overcome those challenges? I, in the end, I'm optimistic about Europe. One of the reasons why I believe it would be a, a disaster for my country to withdraw from Europe is that in the end, I think that underlying rationale for Europe will prevail. But I think it's going to require strong political leadership and a real willingness of Europe, both inside individual nations and at a European level, to confront those challenges. And one final thing I would say is, is, is this, that in a world that is going to be, in the 21st century, multipolar. And I was the biggest geopolitical change that, that's going to happen in my children's lifetime. It's going to be a geopolitics in the 21st century that looks quite different from the 20th century. Right. If that is true, then in my view, for the world to develop in a, in a good and harmonious way, we need a strong European Union. We actually need the European Union to succeed. Europe needs it to succeed, but the world needs it to succeed as well. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's very interesting that what, um, when one hears attentively this discussion, one finds that the problem that the European Union faces is pretty much the problems that the United Nations faces, which is that the governance 
of the European Union, just like the governance of the United Nations, is done by governments. The, EU, the UN is the sum of its governments. The EU is and has become more and so since 2008, the result of the actions of the governments. Now, I think if you ask me, is, it, is this governance going to be confrontational or cooperative? I think what we have learned since 2008 is that it can only be cooperative. It can only be cooperative. And this is what we saw with the creation of the G20 and the amount of measures that were put together to prevent uh, looking into the abyss. And this is what we have seen in the European Union, which despite all the imperfections has made enormous progress in its economic governance under the pressure of the crisis. Where I have a big problem is what happens with the citizens. Do we, are we working, are governments working to get citizens on board or are they uh, working to make sure the citizens move from passive to aggressive? Because if it's from passive to aggressive, we are going to have a big problem. Now citizens care, citizens don't care about voting rights in the IMF. They don't care about how many members the Security Council has. What citizens care is about jobs. What citizens care is about inequalities. What citizens care is about inclusiveness. And so, uh, frankly, we go back to uh, the list of questions you ask us to think about. I think if, if there are two major issues in my view, whether it's in the EU or whether it's outside the EU, inequalities within countries, it's a major one and the lack of inclusiveness of the youth, of many women, of poor segments of society are a huge threat to those who want to do uh, governance. Final point, I very much agree with Tony Blair. It's a question of also if governments want to move the citizens more towards the active than to the aggressive, it's about the narrative. What is it that we are telling them today? We are telling them today on the eve of the European Union elections, of the European Parliament elections, we are telling them that all the problems they have is because Brussels is dictating on them a set of horrible measures that is increasing unemployment, that is making their neighbors look bad, that blames on immigration all their problems. So frankly, it's about for governments, in addition to tackling inequalities, in addition to tackling inclusive issues, inclusiveness issues, is about making sure we give a narrative that corresponds to the uh, geostrategic and geopolitic changes that are taking place in the world. Thank you. <laughs> Prime Minister, please. I would like to make a few comments on Tony Blair's speech, if you allow me. Uh, you mentioned about the uh, potential changes of uh, geopolitics of the 21st century. And you said that uh, it could be different from geopolitics of the 20th century. I believe this change already happened. We just didn't realize that uh, right now we live in a different world. We, dif we live in a different world uh, we used to believe in even a few years ago. We do remember that uh, 08, 09, it was a crisis in the United States. 10, 11, 12, it was crisis in Europe, in Eurozone. And now it's time for emerging markets. Time for emerging markets has come. We didn't realize it yet, but this is the, the reality. And what is happening right now is the different um, zones are fighting to find the proper markets for their goods. The most competitive economy right now is the US economy because they have the cheaper energy. They have few times cheaper energy than in Eurozone. They have equally skilled labor in US and in, in Europe, but to compare with energy, US economy is more competitive. And now what we see is the negotiation between the US and European Union, what is happening right now about the free trade agreement, which in fact means if the potential 
sale of U.S. goods into Europe because American goods will be more competitive than European goods. This is my view, but because I think, because of the energy, not because of the skills, because the cost of energy is much as with the shale gas and with the shale oil, the industries are coming back to the United States. Huh? You, I think the whole world is changing right now. Uh, the China had a huge appetite for energy. Uh, the uh, Chinese energy depends on coal very much. And the shortage of coal, the end of the coal in the China is visible right now. And they resolved the issue of the energy yesterday in Shanghai. They, they had a 30 years contract with gas with, with, with the Russian Federation, which means the geopolitics and economy and the reality where we are living right now is quite different. That's why we have to be very careful and we have to think twice and calculate very carefully where we are living right now, what kind of the decision we have to make right now. And it's very difficult to predict what will be in a few years' time from now, how economy will be influencing the geopolitics and vice versa. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mr. Gensmore, you want yes, please. If I uh, may react to some of the remarks of a very lively and uh, interesting debate. Uh, Prime Minister, you are right that uh, the U.S. economy has an enormous uh, competitive advantage with uh, the low energy costs uh, at the moment. Uh, and it's true that some industry is moving into the United States, but it's one part of the industry. It's the very high energy intensive industry. So it's a uh, steel industry, it's uh, crystal, it's uh, pharmaceuticals, but uh, this also offers a chance for Europe. Because I tell you the example of uh, one of our major Austrian steel producers who is now investing uh, half a billion euros in a new plant in Texas, uh, making use of the low energy prices what are they doing? They are producing uh, a material that we call steel pellets, which is, let's say, a pre-material for the sophisticated steel production that we have in Europe. And these steel pellets then will be transported uh, uh, to Europe, and there we are going to produce the sophisticated metals we need in order to supply the German car industry, which at the end of the day, makes the product much more price competitive than it was before and will not lead to a major transfer of jobs uh, from Europe into the United States because the alternative sites for this Texas plant that is built right now have not been in the center of Europe but uh, would have been in the Black Sea area or in other emerging markets. So what is happening is that many of the investments that under other conditions would have gone to emerging markets are going now to the United States of America uh, due to the low energy costs. And therefore, uh, I very much support what our Portuguese friend said, that of course, a smartly negotiated free trade agreement between uh, Europe and the United States of America uh, can be an additional booster uh, for growth on both sides because there are complementary uh, elements in the, in the economy of the United States and of Europe that could, uh, strengthen, that could strengthen both sides. But the important thing is, do we need Europe or not? Uh, Tony made a very bold statement. Nowadays in the G8, there are four European countries. It's Germany, it's France, it's the United Kingdom, and it is it's Italy. In the year 2040, no, no member state of the European Union will have the size of an economy that would qualify for the G8, not even Germany. And if the economic zone, the European Union, that nowadays 
is responsible for 25% of the world's GDP, and which is the largest economic zone, is not represented in this G8, I think this makes a very robust argument why we need uh, the European unification and the European voice in order to be present uh, in this, in this uh, multipolar world. And therefore, I think, as uh, such a voice will not come into existence, if you have a more robust appearance also concerning the outside, I think it's so eminently important that we are not only talking about economic policies, but that we are talking about a joint foreign and security policy of Europe that is supporting this process uh, of unification. Thank you. Is there any comment from our panelists for time I comes from the emerging markets? We need more Europe. Yeah, Romano, please. Just a reservation for Europe, you know. Uh, broadly speaking, there is a fashion now to describe Europe as a museum, you know. And uh, uh, as uh, has been told now, oh, I don't know whether we are bigger than the United States or not, but the same, the same size at least, you know. We are number one in GDP, but certainly number one by far in industrial production, number one in export. Please be calm to say Europe is gone, you know, because Europe is the most important laboratory of history of new institutions. And because it's done peacefully, we need time. And I am not surprised that we must go up and down and we have this crisis. And I do believe that after the elections, uh, also because of the increase of the anti-European parties, the two big European parties will be obliged together to shape a new Europe. Otherwise, they are lost, and they know that this is the last frontier. And this may be more, more optimistic, the fact that a new policy will be done but clearly, and we go to the point, this, uh, you know, we must change the behavior of uh, the member states because the institution, the European institution, now has been weakened in the last years and only the policy is done by the member state and uh, mainly by one member state, that is Germany. Now, the problem of Europe has not been the euro, or not only the euro, or not mainly the euro, but the fact that we have not adopted the simple anti-crisis policy that the United States have adopted and China has adopted. Simply, we didn't do what anybody has done in the world, because there were member states against that, with the austerity idea that, our, as our Portuguese friend has been, he has clearly appointed that uh, not even Germany and France, they stuck, stuck on, are obeying it, and they are imposing to others this, this policy. The problem in Europe is very simple, to change policy without violating any Maastricht rule. Because if you grow, you can respect the deficit, the deficit imposed by Maastricht very easily. It's not a problem. I did it for many years, decreasing my debt. And it was easy, simply because we were growing. If you don't grow and the denominator GDP goes down, it's impossible to have a correct balance sheet. And so the problem is to change policy as it is the problem in many, many situations. Second observation, uh, Europe will be the same. And here, Tony, this is a problem, you know. Uh, we must have, you told that we must have many obligations together, you know, to do something essential together. But, you know, when a country like UK 
uh, has a referendum to stay in or out, this is a, a bad message, you know. How, how can you say to people, to the Indians that are your uh, historical counterpart, look, Europe will be great, and you say, look, we shall see after the election whether we stay in or out, you know. This is, uh, this is a clear political problem that we have to tackle, you know. And so, uh, Europe will go on. Uh, the Euro crisis, I think, is basically is over, even if we have a lot of problems to deal. But after the election, there will be a new Europe in which uh, new goals will be settled. But I am afraid that not all the countries will agree on that. And so probably we may have a two-speed Europe, you know. But in spite of that, we can go on and then we can join Europe together again. But uh, clearly, this is a moment of change, but the European idea and the European goals are still there, and Europe in, in 2040, when uh, Alfred told uh, no country will be in G8, Europe will be a leading country in the G8. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I will please. Thank you very much. Uh, I think that it is not only a crisis. Uh, I think that it is uh, the hill of uh, history. And, uh, and uh, l let me go to a few remarks from a uh, different side. Uh, first of all, uh, a governing. Today is governed by the economy and the development. The stronger the economy, the stronger the country. And it is okay. But I think that we forgot the, uh, what uh, governing means. I would like to emphasize that governing is a responsibility as well. Responsibility. Second remark is about big picture. In Poland, my generation, 50 plus, has a saying that a man must conceive a son, build a house, and plant a, 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 a tree. And look at this. A son is a next generation. A house and a tree are for few next generations. It was a big picture. This is not a one-off. We have to look at the world in a big picture. Nowadays, we are selfish. We are looking at the tips of our nose. And we have to see more than this. Tabloid culture is not enough. Carpe diem is Absolutely not enough. Ferdinand is uh, about dialogue. Because I, I, I think that the dialogue is the base of development. Since the world was created, there has been a dialogue. As long as the dialogue is, the world exists as well. Next, but. <laughs> but in the end of the dialogue should be compromised. I, I think that uh, EU, the EU is a good example for good dialogue. And sometimes ago I worked at the EBRD. It's a very, very good bank. This bank showed how much they can do, not only as a bank, but an international institution. And there is a domination of banks. Without banks, economy is not good. Without banks, the level, uh, development is not fast. We should create such international 
and interstate development banks for the future. Banks that not only give the capital and credit, but also will lead investors to other countries and sometimes to absolutely different the world. Thank you. Thank you. Rick, please. Well, uh, thanks. Thanks for, for another opportunity. I'd, uh, I'd like to, to, to touch upon the big picture that, uh, that was raised here, but the big picture in a, in a different dimension. Uh, at some point, uh, well, probably the heyday of the European Union was the period of enlargement, of expansion, of taking new members. And, uh, and uh, it was a very successful process. And, um, and then it started struggling for all kinds of reasons. But, uh, but there, are, there are two key countries in which, uh, in which the accession process uh, did not go as well as it could have, in my opinion. And these happen to be the countries that are uh, the bridge countries for the European Union between, uh, between the core EU, the core Europe, if you will, and, uh, and what is happening right next to the European borders. And one of them is Turkey, and the other is Ukraine. And uh, there were times in the accession process where the membership for those two countries uh, were very seriously discussed. And this is no longer the case for, uh, for a number of reasons, and there's probably no time to get into these reasons. But the way that Europe is uh, capable of addressing uh, its links or even belonging of Turkey and Ukraine to the European family, I think to a large extent is going to determine the European capacity to play a global role. Because I would agree with uh, Prime Minister Prodi that uh, European Union, despite all its struggles, is, is still one big uh, economic powerhouse. But uh, whether or not Europe is a big geopolitical powerhouse, uh, is to a large extent going to be determined to, so, as to how it deals with, uh, with the areas uh, that is right at its borders. And right now Ukraine is very complicated because it, it involves dealing with Russia. Uh, as, uh, as somebody who comes from Serbia, one is, it, it's natural to be a, a, big, uh, a big supporter of, uh, of a close European and Russian cooperation. Uh, I'd personally like to see this uh, crisis uh, go away as quickly as possible. I'm not sure if I have any prescription as to how this can happen, but this is clearly, in my opinion, in the larger interest of Europe. Uh, but um, when it comes to Turkey, I think this is something that must be revived. Uh, and Turkey's gone through some difficult period, and one would argue that there is there are difficulty going on right now in, in Turkey, but, uh, but Turkey is one of the essential links of Europe to this uh, critical area of significance. It's been for a while. I expect it is going to continue being a critical theater, and that is the Middle East. And um, as somebody who comes from a country that uh, is aspiring to join the European Union, we're, we haven't made it there yet, um, a lot of... Uh, I, I heard once a joke. Uh, a fellow foreign minister at the time told me this joke. Well, it was actually an anecdote, not a joke. Uh, some of you here perhaps um, remember Viktor Chernomerdin. And uh, his last post in the Russian government was when he was uh, uh, ambassador of the Russian Federation to Kiev. And once he was famously asked in a press conference, uh, who do you think Mr. Chernomerdin is going to join the European Union first? Is it going to be Turkey or Ukraine? And his answer was uh, clearly, Turkey. And then the follow-up question was when? And he said, never. <laughs> I think this is something that's perhaps true, but also perhaps something that needs to be addressed very seriously by the European leaders if one wants to think about the big global role for the European Union in the 21st century. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Sajik, please. Well, I actually, um, I'm here as the, uh, you know, uh, representative of, of ECOSOC, but uh, uh, as a European, 
I cannot uh, not take part in this discussion. And I'm not a European politician, a former European politician, but a simple European citizen. Uh, and uh, I believe that uh, what was said before, that we need a positive narrative for Europe, this is really true. And, uh, and there is a positive narrative if we simply uh, think about the history. Uh, on the 1st of uh, May uh, this year, it's the 10th anniversary uh, that 10 uh, new member countries joined the European Union. And uh, these past uh, 10 years have been actually successful years. Uh, more or less none of the uh, new member countries, uh, with some few small minor uh, exceptions, really created any additional uh, economic problems in the European Union, and certainly not none of them uh, also now in the, you know, in the Eurozone. Uh, and uh, I think uh, one should also uh, see that as a positive sign. We've had uh, in 2007 uh, Bulgaria and Romania joining. Also, this went very successful. And also now, as the 28th member, we have Croatia. Now, but one thing we always have to keep in mind, all these countries joined uh, on, a, on a free basis after some, you know, long negotiations. And uh, they uh, joined voluntarily. And this is, uh, you know, not a union uh, that you join because you will not get some gas deliveries if you don't join. Or this is not a union where you can, uh, that you have to join because uh, you cannot sell your chocolate or you cannot sell your wine. Uh, here, uh, this is something uh, completely different. You have uh, an, a union where you join freely on a free basis. And we now have accession negotiations uh, with Serbia. We have accession negotiations uh, with Montenegro. And uh, so uh, this, uh, Europe, uh, this European Union, this success story of the European Union will continue. The European Union is also uh, different than the United States. Nobody in Europe bought a new country or a new state. The U.S. bought Alaska and uh, uh, you know, other states in the South. This doesn't happen in Europe. This is all on a voluntary basis. And I think this is an important narrative that we always have to keep in mind. This is a positive narrative. And uh, you know, also this uh, positive narrative is necessary uh, when we have the, the elections on Sunday. Uh, the parliamentary uh, elections on Sunday. For the first time, we have, and this is going slowly in Europe, one step after the other, like a snail, but for the first time, we have uh, two uh, you know, uh, leading candidates from the two uh, main uh, groups, and we know uh, who, if the one or the other will be winning, uh, then uh, this will be uh, the next president of the European Commission, one of the uh, then successors of uh, Romano Prodi. So also here, Europe is developing slowly, but it is developing. And it is a shame that uh, the, the strongest you know, anti-European uh, movement and probably the strongest anti-European party in Europe will be in a country which is not uh, have a part of the Eurozone. Also this, one should not forget that uh, here uh, this, this will be the, you know, the strongest way. So it means that in this country where there is such a strong anti-European movement, uh, there is not enough of a positive narrative. Uh, and uh, it, it, that also means that uh, also the, I think the politicians in these countries have not done enough to have a positive European narrative. Thank you. Thank you. As we are uh, almost done with our panel, why don't we take one or two questions from the floor before we close our panel? Please. So we leave the floor open for two or three questions? Yes. And please introduce yourself. Hi. Uh, good evening. My name is Serdar Yilmaz. I am from Turkey, from Istanbul. Uh, but I don't want to talk about European Union as I'm uh, tired of that. I want to talk about something else and ask uh, some, uh, something else. Uh, since uh, I heard uh, some of you distinguished uh, guests uh, talking about making some uh, changes in the United Nations, well, uh, I deeply believe in something uh, that if you think that we need to and it is time to make some changes in the United Nations, please do not go far away. Let's start 
diminishing the power of the countries in the United Station Nations Security Council. By means of that, everybody will see that peace, international corporations, global development, and zero poverty will be achieved. Isn't that possible? Thank you. Thank you. Why don't we take two more? Yes, sir, please, in the front. Over there. Hi, good afternoon, gentlemen. Thank you very much. This has been fa fascinating. However, I don't know, you were a little, bit, a little bit shy, did not talk about Ukraine. Uh, what will be, what, do, what is your expectation of what, how this is going to end, how fast it's going to end, and uh, how is it that Germany, for instance, getting involved in all this game, while in fact, if any shortage of gas happens there, your expectation that 300,000 to half a million uh, jobs will be lost. How do you think this is going to end? Thank you very much. Thank you. And let's take a final question. Uh, good afternoon, uh, distinguished panels. Mohammed Al Hamwadi, again from the United Arab Emirates, uh, Chief Executive in Risk Source. Uh, you discussed all possible issues related to global governance, related to the future of the EU, related to the uh, United Nations. Uh, and I want to ask you one uh, open question and want to hear from the maximum number of people possible. Where is the location of the Middle East with its huge natural resources, with its emerging uh, power, with its growing demographics, where is its location in the multipolar system? Or more than multipolar system? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Who wants to take uh, one of these questions? Yes. Yeah, please. Maybe uh, on the issue of the United Nations, I think I just would like to say two points. Uh, uh, when the United Nations was created, it was created, uh, of course, to restrain power, arbitrary power, and to promote the uh, principles. So it was always a contest between power and principles. So that debate will still go on, but we live in a real world, therefore there has to be a balance between this power and principles. Uh, but what we also know is that cooperation is the uh, way of the future. If you look at the collective security, collective development, and collective solidarity, the principles that you have in the United Nations are indispensable for all of us. Uh, you may make progress in one or two areas, one or two years, but if you really are looking for a sustainable progress, the fundamental principles of the United Nations, which talks about global peace, global solidarity, but also global economic development on a sustainable basis is the key to the future. I think when you look at the conflicts and terrorism and maybe when you look at the resources that you have around the world and the challenges of migration that came up uh, when we are discussing all of that, when you look at all of these issues, I think multilateralism is the key to the future for the solution of all these problems. So we believe that it is in the self-interest of even the most powerful countries to see to it that international institutions like the United Nations are strengthened and the global rules and the global uh, you know, mechanisms are neither, not, not only reinforced but also followed through. Thank you. Isenbauer, yes. Do you want me to take the Ukraine? Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, we all hope that there will be a good presidential elections on Sunday, uh, and I hope that the vast majority of the population can participate. And of course, we hope that uh, a new president, uh, first of all, is uh, trying to unite the country, uh, which means uh, 
going for a grand coalition or a government of national unity, inviting the different forces uh, that are there in the country to cooperate and to overcome the very severe crisis. Uh, at the same time, uh, to indicate uh, to the Russian Federation that the new president is ready to uh, talk and to engage uh, on all the open issues that are on the table in order to uh, in order to sort out the conflict that is most obviously there. Uh, and thirdly, uh, a president that is uh, sending a message uh, to the West, especially to uh, Europe and uh, to the United States, uh, that he is trying to clean up uh, this uh, crony capitalist country where uh, an enormous part of the wealth is in the hands of few, independent of which government has been there uh, in place up to now, uh, and is trying to uh, establish uh, a rule of law that uh, makes it possible uh, for many all around uh, Europe and the US uh, to support this country also in its, uh, uh, economic, in, its, in its economic destiny. This is what we wish. If this is going to happen, nobody can say because uh, uh, the situation is uh, quite escalated in, in some parts of uh, the Ukraine. Uh, Crimea has been uh, taken by the Russian Federation. Uh, but I think if there is the joint intention to de-escalate the situation, uh, that there are still possibilities to do it. And the important thing is a broad participation in the elections on Sunday because this would offer the highest legitimation uh, for a future president to engage uh, uh, in a duty that is uh, of enormous magnitude. Q. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, just two words, one on Turkey, the other one on Ukraine. About, uh, first of all, if you, if you ask to where Europe can grow physically, the good answer is obviously Turkey. It's not just a, a territorial question. It's a definition of a more larger club. That means uh, it's very relevant to Europe to have a relevant position in the relationship with um, Islamic world. And um, uh, it's decisive to our stability because, okay, now we have some problems in the north of Europe, and, but don't forget that some very sensitive, critical questions are in the Maghreb, Mediterranean, and Middle East region. And they will come back if we don't contribute to solve them. Uh, so Turkey would be the largest strategic, visionary project to the enlargement of Europe. Little problem. One of these days, the question will not be if Turkey is in or out. It'll, it'll, it will become if Turkey is pro or against, because the question, the process is deadlocked, tremendously deadlocked. It would be very good also for the internal market. Problem is a demographic one. It's very difficult to convince some European countries to accept that Turkey would become in Sooner, sooner than later, the largest populated country of EU, that's one question, and there are other cultural prejudices, and I don't think we should uh, adapt or discuss even those kind of, uh, of, of cultural prejudices. Uh, on the Ukraine, I, I would just call your attention, I, I personally say, think that the basic strategic agreement that EU needs to stabilize the region is with Russia. I told it, I said it before, and I, it's my opinion, probably Vuk would be, uh, would agree. Um, but uh, let me just tell you uh, two uh, things, one thing, one basic thing. 
if I'm not sure that is the best attitude to a country who has two souls to challenge that country to choose one soul against the other because you risk the split of those souls. And I'm a realistic man, on, namely on foreign policy. If you don't have the force to kill the bear, don't provoke the bear. Thank you. Thank you. Let me now give the floor to um, Murat Karmisakov. Uh, Murat has been the organizer of this uh, anti-crisis conference to give him the final word. Murat, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair, dear panelists, uh, dear guests. Uh, first of all, let me, on behalf of Eurasian Economic Club of Scientists, which unites representatives from 130 countries around the world, express our gratitude to UN General Assembly to all distinguished guests and, of course, to everybody who took and taking part in such important conference as Second World Anti-Crisis Conference. As you know, First Anti-Crisis Conference, with the support of UN General Assembly, uh, Take, took place in uh, Astana last year within the framework of Six Astana Economic Forum. And the main goal of this conference was Astana Declaration and the main 16 anti-crisis uh, direction and principles aimed to develop uh, effective actions to prevent the global economic and financial crisis to future recessions, which is much important uh, to prevent all challenges, not only economic, financial, but uh, social and natural and uh, the formation of the concept of World Anti-Crisis Conference Plan took 10 months of great teamwork of leading international and financial institutions around the world think tanks, non-government organizations, and of course, uh, leading of uh, mass media representatives. It was based on discussion on G-Global Info Communicative Platform, initiated by our president, and uh, a lot of seminars and meetings uh, of the World Anti-Crisis uh, Conference held around the world. You know that the first plenary session of the second Anti-Crisis Conference was held on uh, May 2 this year within the 47 ADB annual meeting in Astana with the result of uh, welcoming of concept of all anti-crisis conference. This international anti-crisis project supports the UN member states in their work to define the post-2015 agenda and a new set of goals for sustainable development and all expert community encourage regional commissions 
and the international financial institutions to use the concept of Fourth Anti-Crisis Conference as an opportunity to help build together the world we want. In order to further prepare the World Anti-Crisis Plan, we propose close interaction of all international and financial institutions in its development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Murat. On that note, I'm now going to close the panel. I would like to thank again Prime Minister again for your invitation to be able to interact with global leaders on an important issue. We have been talking about multipolar world. We are talking about the role of emerging market. Clearly, this is a phase of a new creation. 70 years ago, there was a Bretton Woods Conference. In the next 10 years, we are going to define the multipolar world. On that note, I would like to ask you to share and to extend a warm applause to our leaders tonight. Thank you.